Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Christos Cholkas, and I'm, I, I want to uh, welcome you to Writers Victoria, the State of the Writing Nation Oration for 2020. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging that we are, um, that I'm standing here on the lands of the Kulin Nation, um, and all of us would like to extend uh, our respects to elders past, present and emerging. And we also want to acknowledge that this land, uh, sovereignty was never ceded to this land. Uh, thank you for, um, for attending this, uh, this oration. It's a, I don't need to tell you that 2020 is a very strange year. Um, I'm a patron of uh, Writers Victoria, a very proud patron. It's a story I, I, I tell every year, but it's an important one. When I was a uh, a young writer, um, just just beginning to write reviews, just beginning to, uh, to to think and dream of one day being published. Uh, I'd, I'd started off writing for the street press, little reviews um, about gigs I'd seen, films I'd seen, and being coming from a you know a strongly union family, I approached MEAA, which is my union now, but. I said, oh, I'd like to join the union. And they said, have you been published and have you been paid? And I said, uh, no, I've been published, but I haven't been paid. And they said, come back when you're getting paid. And that, uh, I realised maybe I wasn't a writer. And then I came to this organisation, to, to uh, what was then the Victorian Writers' Centre, and they took me seriously. And they, they just gave me information I needed to, to begin to think about what it meant to, to, to do this writing life. Uh, that's why it's, I, I, there's actual real proud, uh, pride in, um, in being a patron uh, here. The state of the writing oration is something that's been going on for three years now. Uh, the uh, inaugural oration was by the wonderful Tony Birch. Last year it was uh, Maxine Beniba Clark and this year uh, we're very, very fortunate to have the equally wonderful Maria Tamarkin doing um, doing the uh, the paper or the, the talk. Um, I, I think there are two things that are important to say about the oration. One is that it is an opportunity to talk about what writing means for us at this moment in time. Uh, and given the, the way the pandemic has changed our world, um, given that it has meant that there's a pressures now on writers being able to write, being able to pay the bills, being able to pay their rent. Um, it's an, a really uh, crucial that there's opportunities for writers like Maria um, to discuss what's going on in our world and what it means to be a writer in Australia, in Victoria, in 2020. Um, and now I'm going to need my glasses because there's something I don't want to get wrong at all, that uh, the money that comes from this event goes to the Writers Victoria Disadvantage Writers Fund, which aims to increase opportunities for writers who experience financial and social barriers to developing their writing skills and connecting with the writing and publishing community. Uh, donations to the fund, which includes um, your, your uh, payment for this event, provide free or heavily subsidised professional development opportunities for emerging writers throughout the state of Victoria experiencing difficulties arising from financial hardship. And clearly, this is a year when, I mean, this, this kind of fund, this is one of the, uh, the things that Writers Victoria does that I think is most wonderful about this uh, organisation, but clearly it's uh, of vital and crucial importance in um, 2020. The fund was established in June of 2018, and a couple of the wonderful things it's done is, it's given five partial bursaries for writers who are residents of public and social housing to attend the workshop Memoir in a Year, Protecting Yourself. Three bursary places for Indigenous writers to Melissa Lushenko's, Lukashenko's workshop, Writing, Race and Class, An Aboriginal Perspective. There's a further list. Please go on to the Writers Victoria uh, website. And I thank you once again on behalf of everyone at Writers Victoria for attending this, um, this oration. Uh, I am very excited about the two writers that um, are going to uh, be on to, uh, um, I was going to say tonight, but today, I don't know what time you'll be watching it, but um, the first one is Jean Bachura, and he is the inaugural recipient of the Wheeler Centre Scheme for Writers, The Next Chapter. His work is reflective of a life lived between cultures, 
born in Damascus, raised in Syria, Lebanon and Australia. In 2016, he was awarded the Deborah Cass Prize for his piece, Nightfalls. In 2017, he wrote No Man's Land, an account of his journey crossing the border into Syria. In 2019, his multi-platform project, Tretinoir, I hope I pronounced that right, Jean, was awarded the Lifted Brow and RMIT Nonfiction Lab Prize for Experimental Nonfiction. I do know Jean, I have admired his wit and the, uh, the power and discipline of his writing for, for a long time. There's a Greek word called Livendis, and like the best Greek words, I'm not sure how I would translate it into English, but it means top dude. <laughs> Maybe that's the best way to translate it. And Jean always is electric. Jean always, uh, always excites me uh, when I hear his writings, when I see his performances. So it's, it's wonderful that he's part of uh, uh, th this event. Maria Tamarkin writes books, essays, reviews, and pieces for performance and radio. She collaborates with sound and visual artists and has had her work carved into dockside tiles. I'm so jealous. She is the author of four books of ideas. Her fourth and most recent book is Axiomatic, which won the 2018 Melbourne Prize for Literature and was shortlisted for the National Book Critics Circle Awards in the United States. The Stella Prize and the Prime Minister's New South Wales and Victorian Premier's Awards. Axiomatic was named a New Yorker Top 10 Book of 2019 and it is a Top 10 Book of the Decade, in my opinion. Maria is a recipient of the 2020 Wyndham Campbell Prize in the category of nonfiction. She holds a PhD in cultural history and is a senior lecturer in the creative writing program at the University of Melbourne. Um, really, there's not much else to say except that I've only met Maria a couple of times in my life, but the power of her writing um, is such in her books and in her essays where it is incredibly rigorous and intelligent. It is incredibly powerful. Her mind is razor sharp. Her writing just has such a, um, an elegance and a questioning that um, I, I, I take copious amounts of notes every time I read her work. I don't know Maria, but she, her presence as a writer is so strong that often I am reading something or I'm thinking about something and I'm wondering, hey, I wonder what Maria would think of this. I mean, that happened twice, truly, over the last couple of weeks. It's, this is a really strange time, not only because of the pandemic, but I think that it is a time where we really have a need for more argument of good faith. Um, people who are questioning and people who um, who make us think and um, unsettle preconceptions. Uh, it is not a problem to argue. It's not a, I argue when I read Maria in my head all the time, and it's one of the things that I think is riveting and most crucial about her, her writing. I'm so looking forward to hearing her oration tonight. I, th I think it is a great privilege for, for, for us. Thank you to Jean and thank you to Maria for, um, for agreeing to do this tonight. I'll go away now. Thank you. I went to the same high school as Osama bin Laden. At 12 years old, I convinced my parents to send me to the prestigious boarding school for the sake of my academic future. The campus was stunning. Nestled in the Lebanese mountains, umbrella pines as far as the eye could see, and a vista overlooking a valley straight down to the Beirut coastline. Ramana High School, BHS a Quaker school established in 1873 by Theopolis Waldemar. I can still see his bronze bust guarding the administration building. In the evenings, clouds of dense mist would engulf the campus and amber street lights would exaggerate their outline. It felt like a scene from the video game Silent Hill. We had weekly assemblies at the main hall where a minute of silence was mandated. My PE teacher would often recount. Osama's father came to Bramana to visit him one day. It was during recess and my father, who was also a teacher, was on duty. Osama's father stared at the children running around the basketball court for some time before walking up to my father and asking him, which one is my son?
I wonder what Osama's teachers were like during his time at BHS. I don't recall many teachers having an impact on me, beside Miss R, my English literature teacher. Miss R was something else. She oozed intelligence, poise, bohemian elegance, and a sense of awareness. She had an allure to her. She had an aura about her. She never talked down to us. She treated us like adults. That was new to us. This was around 2003, just as the US invasion of Iraq was springing. Slowly, our English literature curriculum shifted to encompass more current events. Homework assignments switched from analyzing A Midsummer Night's Dream to watching news from several different news channels and dissecting the information being communicated. Not just the information, but how it was delivered. What words were used specifically to discuss the same topic and what connotations those words had? What agendas were at play? We discussed how George Bush Jr. had an odd way of pronouncing Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein. Saddam. Like he was purposely mispronouncing the Iraqi president's name to elicit an emotional response. We discussed how Western media coverage of the Iraqi war seemed so removed from the devastation it was causing. CNN used wide camera angles and documented the war with panoramic views, like some horrible landscape painting. That green night vision footage showing countless American bombs falling over the city of Baghdad. This ancient, this ancient cradle of civilization was being destroyed before our very eyes and it was made to look like a computer game. Just as infuriating was the Iraqi information minister repeatedly stating that US troops are nowhere near Baghdad as the US tanks were rolling through the streets. Western media nicknamed him Baghdad Bob. YouTube comments refer to him as the true father of fake news. Miss R would say, as global citizens, you have a duty to be informed. Ignorance is a luxury. Consume as much news from as many different sources as you can and make up your own mind. The veil had been lifted. Thin rays of sunlight burst through tiny holes in a steel barrel roof of Sultan Hamadiyya. Some streams intersect at points within the 10 high meter expanse. Others end in a bright yellow speck on the volcanic cobblestone paving. Each shaft memorializes the bullet that caused it. Most of these are from World War I and the Great Syrian Revolt against French occupation. I'm not sure what new additions have been made recently. Layla troops over the irregular cobblestones in rose gold ballerina flats, loose linen pants, and a sheer silk top. I follow her, cautious not to trip over my feet. This market is incredibly crowded on the quietest of days. Almost any product can be found here or within... Okay. or within a connecting market. Syrian souks are different to traditional shopping centers. Each section is designated to a particular category of products. For example, you have the pajama market, which connects to the toy market, which connects to the electronics market, the gold market, silver market, mosaics, silk, Tupperware, etc. Each market has up to 50 stalls selling similar products. It's an absolute wonderland, bursting to the seams with bright colors, textures, kitsch, kitsch, kitsch. It also connects to some of the most famous touristic attractions in Damascus. Ancient temples, palaces, khans, mosques, hammams. The suit is disorienting and you can easily be led astray by the countless merchants by the countless merchants trying to reel you in. I look up to the bullet holes every time I'm overwhelmed by the streetscape. I find solace in the beautiful array of light. Layla passes through a large patch of sunlight coming from an opening in the market facade. It renders her silk top see-through, highlighting her lace Simone pearly bra. Several, dress several men dressed in abayas and takiyas stare at her as we pass by. They mutter profanities under their breath. Mum, people can see your bra. Let them. They aren't people, they're cockroaches. Put a jacket on, I plead. Let them cover their eyes. It's a hot, dry day. Layla is in no mood for bullshit. We approach a brightly lit lingerie stall where a group of women, all covered in long navy robes and tightly wrapped hijabs, argue with the clerk. One thousand women shouts. Sister, believe me, wallahi, that's under cost price. The clerk responds. That's all you're getting from us. An older woman adds. Auntie, please don't embarrass me. Give me what I ask. You either take it or we're going across to your neighbor. Now put it in a bag and give it to my daughter. 
the clerk concedes and begins folding a bright red lace baby doll lingerie set, complete with garter, g-string, bra, and feather loop. The juxtaposition of conservative Muslim women openly shopping for some of the most provocative lingerie I've ever seen brightens my day. This is a common occurrence in the Sul. Not many people are aware of the innovative world of Syrian lingerie. It is a cutthroat industry where shops have to constantly come up with new styles, materials, and colors. People get bored quickly and nothing is forbidden. I've told Layla that my friends, I've told Layla that my female friends have requested some belly dancing outfits. It's, it's mostly true, except most of my friends aren't female. Stop, stop wasting my, stop wasting my time. What do you have out back? Layla demands from the lingerie store clerk. Okay, madame, come upstairs. He leads us up a narrow stairway to an attic. The ceiling is barely 1.5 meters tall and every surface is filled with inventory too racy to be put on the street front. We sit down on tiny stools. The clerk pulls a box from underneath a shelf. Madame, with all due respect, you're like my mother. These things are natural. He opens the box. We have this model. We took a baby bottle teat, madame, and with all due respect, we filled it with silicone. Then, madame, with all due respect, we inserted a vibrating motor inside it. After that, madame, with all due respect, we stitched it to a lace underwear. And, madame, it's designed for the woman, with all due respect, to insert the baby teat inside her. Layla laughs. He hesitates. Layla pieces his discomfort. You know how they are in Australia. Anything goes. Show us more. Yes, madame. And, with all due respect, this model comes with a remote control too, for the husband to turn it on or off. He looks at me. For your wife? My girlfriend. I have several, I say with confidence. He looks impressed. Just bring them all out already, Layla presses him. Yes, madame. We have edible lingerie made of ch sugar or chocolate. We have a chocolate with underwear inside it. We have glow in the dark phosphory. We have cristal and lace, Dante Carson. We have ones that fall, fall with a clap. Here, clap, clap. The battery is a little weak, but it works, I promise. We have feather ones, red feathers with embroidered pearls. We have disco ones. We have mobile, mobile phone models that sing. Um. We have marriage board games. We have marriage board games. Marriage monopoly for the wife to entertain the husband. The wife has to excite the husband. He pulls out a crystal embroidered set. What colors do you have, I ask him? Black and gold, navy and gold, red and gold, gold and gold. Do you have a larger size? One of my girlfriends is quite big boned. Variety is important. How big? He asks suspiciously. Um, she's about my height. Broad shoulders. God knows what they put in the food over there. Get la at Nancy, we call that one. Because of her song, Ahul Nus. Now the village girl, fashion, fa village girl is in fashion. This size should, should work. Um, yeah, let's just stop it there. What kind of earlier? I don't know how to feel about that one. I kept on fucking up the pages again. No, oh, I thought it was probably one of the better ones. You reckon? Yeah, which is a shame because you didn't finish it. How long was that? No, no, but I was, I was thinking we cut it before then anyway. It's 9 minutes and 43 seconds. Because the way I'm thinking is we cut it straight like in the middle of me talking. I'm giving this talk on the lands that belong and have always belonged to the Kulin Nation, to the Wurundjeri and Bunwurrung people. I pay deep respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I'm a migrant on stolen land and in standing here today, I'm taking someone else's place. This I cannot escape. This I don't want resolved. Because my knowing that this moment does not belong to me, my sense of being out of place, mean I may end up doing something worth doing. No guarantees though. I'm a migrant on stolen land. To understand my family's move to safety as the displacement of others is a lifelong project. Sometimes I fight it. I'm not in the market for fantasies of innocence, I studied history, but to give up the idea of being on the margins, that's for me the heartbeat. I'm newly 46, I work at a university, I'm standing here now. If I am on the margins in any sense, it is because being a writer in Australia is seen as an esoteric thing at best. 
Certainly not a profession, a hobby maybe. And this is the first time I'll say it, and I'll say it again in the next 40 minutes, more than once, Australia does not care about most kinds of artists, but it doesn't care about writers in particular. While this contempt must be fought, in submissions, in agitation and policy work, in, skill, in schools and universities, and I thank from the bottom of my heart those writers, arts workers, educators and advocates who are engaged in this largely unrecognised and thankless labour. While this contempt needs to be kept visible, like a ketchup stain on a thousand dollar suit, a ketchup stain that keeps on spreading, it cannot be, I believe, the defining fight of our lives as writers, or the main conversation we're having in public or private, or the way literature is talked about to children and young people. Orienting ourselves to this contempt and to the struggle it invites us in is a dead end. I'm not finished, but I want to talk about the visible and the invisible a little more first. I'm still introducing myself to you. I spent my childhood and an early to mid-adolescence in Ukraine feeling hyper-visible. Everyone and their dog could tell I was Jewish, my nose, the shape of my face, whatever else. The relief of coming to Australia, where I was illegible, until I opened my mouth and even then, who the hell knew where my accent came from and who the hell cared anyway? I cannot tell you how much I loved it, till I understood what a privilege it was not to be read, and how I, by virtue of making a second home in a settler colony, was now inside the electrified networks of invisibility and hypervisibility in which the invisible had all the power. The invisible claimed to be the every people, and they had things like democracy and human rights and empathy and literature and egalitarianism. It took me long, too long to start learning about the history of that all-conquering, universalizing invisibility and its genesis in whiteness and colonialism, about the harm it has caused and continues to cause the cloak it has thrown over violence and dispossession. Talking to you today is part of this learning. I said yes to giving this address to force myself to do some work, to be made accountable for this year in which I have done hardly any thinking. I'm a secular Jew. I understand how in Australia, antisemitism may seem to many, particularly the younger people, as something of a phantom. Mosquito bites compared to bullet wounds and sliced off flesh. But I come from the country, the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union, where antisemitism was a machine for murdering, exiling, draining life force, destroying families and futures, and I'm not even talking about the Second World War. So this is the history I carry inside of me. This is what I need to tell you about myself. One more thing to say about the kind of migrant I am. Much as I am compelled by the idea of racial capitalism and disaster capitalism, I won't be using the category of capitalism in my talk because I'm a migrant from the land of genocidal anti-capitalism, and it is my history, my dead, which I can neither disown nor forget. To me, the search is on for another different language. This is my particular context. I don't want to argue about it. I have my dead, and you have yours. I'm going to take a breath now. So, what to do with the contempt for writers in this country? I might lose friends here, but for me, the answer is nothing. Being a writer is a serious and important thing, particularly for writers from minoritized communities. The intellectual, spiritual, pedagogical, and testimonial work those writers do is life-giving and life-changing. May I introduce you to a Russian language expression you might find useful? It has certainly felt apt to me more than once since we arrived in Australia in 1990. The expression is to prove you're not a camel. This, just to be clear, is not an anti-camel saying. It's an anti-stupidity saying. I'd like to implore my fellow writers to stop trying to prove in earnest that we're not camels, because for one, all that camel business takes us away from the actual work we need or want to be doing. Doing nothing is not doing nothing, of course. We absolutely should try to look for ways of surviving and forms of enduring and intergenerational solidarity, and we have been. We should be sly and inventive, and we are. And yes, faking it whenever that faking is called for. 
but we should not give ourselves over to addressing this contempt. What I'm trying to think about today is this, how to strike against writers made inconsequential, both atomized and collectivized in ways that diminish us, how to strike against writers made to plead and bleat in public to engage in humiliating platitudes about Australian stories. And platitudes for writers are what acid reflux is for singers, it's bad for our health and it's bad for our work. And I'm thinking about how this question is fundamentally connected to the moment of reckoning and self-reckoning we are in the middle of, a huge moment. To understand that the writerly imagination is not the superpower that transcends time and space and power and race and class and gender in the postcode and history, that all that stuff about universal stories and universal themes is not merely a sticky cliche, but an attack on literature disguised at its, as its most well-intentioned defense. To understand how the corrosive language of rights has been internalized with gusto by white writers such as myself, the right to inhabit the other, the right to the universalizing imagination, and how the language of rights needs to be pushed off the perch so the language of responsibility and accountability can take its place. And how that overthrow leads to the flourishing, not the wilting, not the drying up. I keep coming back to these words from Claudia Rankin and Bess Lafreda. What white writers might do is not imaginatively inhabit the other because that is their writer's artist but instead embody and examine the interior landscape that wishes to speak of rights, that wishes to move freely and unbounded across time, space and lines of power, that wishes to inhabit whomever it chooses. And then later they say, we acknowledge that every act of imaginative sympathy in inevitably has limits. Perhaps the way to expand those limits is not to enter a racial other, but instead to inhabit as intensely as possible the moment in which the imagination sympathy encounters its limit. This is the work, inhabiting the moment in which the imagination sympathy encounters its limit, not the camel stuff. I don't need to tell anyone to tell you how hard this year has been for writers, at least for writers who don't have a plan B or plan C, but tonight I'll just mention people who had their first books out in the middle of the pandemic, years and years of their lives and hearts in those books. Such a scary thing to do, to put a book in the world, your first book. Maybe you never write another one again. And for your little boat to be swallowed like that. My love to you, dear writers of first books. The waves are receding and your books will resurface, are resurfacing now. This year is another reason why I believe we should do nothing. 2020 has been, at least in part, a lesson in how doing nothing is sometimes the sanest and the most necessary thing to do. Let me be blunt. Our attempts to convince this nation that we matter and that we make it better, more united, more self-aware, more civically minded, more productive, are doomed. Evoking moral education of which literature is the number one producer with its patented empathy production capabilities, referring to how productivity is exponentially increased by reading, it makes me feel hollowed out just saying this out loud. Not simply because this country is this or that, but because I don't think these arguments are true. Literature does not make us a more productive nation, it simply doesn't. Arguing that it does is necessary to ensure that the underwhelming, to say the least, and underhanded support from the government continues coming. That the project of defunding is not complete because this support can still be life giving. Let's not pretend though that arguing the link between writing, reading and productivity is anything but demeaning. It's the necessary doublespeak which should not be internalized as, or mistaken for, the actual language of thought and analysis. Frankly, good books should take us away from the kind of work that is implied in these equations and make us question the very idea of productivity and make us sit on the toilets at our places of work when we return to them for 40 minutes at a time, reading, not working. 
good books should make us question the very idea of productivity, make our eyes glaze over at meetings, make our ears bleed in the vicinity of institutional language. Bleeding ears, glazed over eyes, excessive toilet breaks. That's hardly a conventional picture of enhanced productivity. I'm sorry I'm saying we all the time, especially as a white settler writer. I'm putting that we on notice. It's a shorthand and it's something I'll come back to, but you're right not to be impressed. Another breast. <sighs> Literature makes us better people and thus a better nation by teaching us to care and feel for others who are not like us, by teaching us to see those others as equal and interesting. Mm. Firstly, I believe that reading does not make us any more empathetic than, say, gardening. Secondly, I was lucky enough to have a conversation a couple of months ago with Namwali Sopel, a Zambian-American writer whose essay, The Banality of Empathy, was a real thunderbolt, an intellectual thunderbolt for me in the last few years. In the essay, Sopel tore into the expectations that the marginalised should view their art as vehicles for generating and disseminating empathy. This grotesque dynamic, Sir Pell writes, often makes for dull, pandering artworks, and it in fact perpetuates an assumed imbalance in the world. There are those who suffer and those who do not, and thus have the leisure to be convinced by novels and films that produce empathy, that the sufferers matter. When I spoke to Namwali, I asked her about the cause and effect model of imagining the relationship between literature and ethics where literature is the cause while the surge of empathy or other moral feelings is the effect of being in its presence. Namwali said, and I should say that this conversation will be published in, in the next little while, I'm not sure when. Empathy as such is only one heavily promoted mode of ethical engagement. And yes, I think it is intrinsically beset with a certain grotesque dynamic. That is, if you think that hierarchies of power are grotesque. Literature does not create our capacity for empathy or really identification and projection. Our capacity for empathy allows us to create and read literature. And neither empathy nor literature is necessarily a form of moral action. To be clear, language can be active, can do things in the world, but that does not mean all language-based forms do. That's the end of the quote from Namwali. Empathy, Namwali said, also does nothing to resolve the problem of incommensurable values. In the world beyond reading and writing, the foregrounding of empathy can often be one of the biggest barriers to justice, transformative politics, actual change, truth. In the world beyond reading and writing, empathy is often a dodge. Audrey Simpson, a Mohawk political anthropologist from the Kanawaki community in Quebec and a professor at Columbia University, talks about how in the interactions between settler states and their First Nations peoples, Emotions are made to work a specified wound so that a show can go on so we could have a better past and get on with it. Do I need to say that hackneyed little phrase? This sounds eerily familiar. In settler states, empathy, affect, emotions have been doing the work of managing national histories and their legacies so that the foundational genocides can be left behind in the service of what Simpson calls contractual thinking which tries to neutralize or end all further claims of harm. Let's do this and be done with it, boys and girls. Empathy, which often collapses into identification, operates, Simpson says, as another field of force. And centering empathy is one of the most familiar moves in the Settler Innocence playbook, which should make us at the very least squeamish about using this term on our banners. In summary, as they say, A. Australian nation does not care about writers. I mean, this nation did not and does not care about asylum seekers, onshore and offshore, not even about them. B. Australian nation and settler nationalism are deeply compromised categories. But there is a C there as well. C. Most Australian writers don't care about the nation. The nation of Australia. The nation as distinct from the actual people and the actual places. The nation of Australia is not a horizon they're writing to, not an entity they're addressing in their work, not a subject matter they're building up their powers to examine. Most writers I know at least would put 10 more adjectives in front of the word writer to describe who they are before they get to Australian.
Part two, a public lecture or an address can be a violent form. The lecture is always under threat of being vanquished in an instant by the intrusion of violence, writes Mary Capella. Capella, who's a friend, says the lecture at its best, and we can extend this to a public address, is fundamentally not about knowledge being put in the world. ta -ra -ra -ra. It is about suspending familiar forms of attention to allow other forms to wake in the name of making possible access to different relationships to language, feeling, knowing, being. The lecture, as Capella imagines it, encourages hover and drift and fogginess and dreaming. Capella also says, as women, we've still to take back the night to say nothing of the lectern. Noted. A lecture or a public address is potentially displacing mode. So in this part, part two, I will attempt to displace it back, to counter-displace it by contaminating it with another form, that of a census. This year, contamination feels like a useful mode of thinking and sharing that thinking, going for tarnished forms and trying to make them do something they were emphatically not built to do. A census is a mechanism for systematically capturing information about a population or a group in a specific fixed moment in time. A kind of a needle puncturing the skin of a country or a community, a kind of a needle you drop on a moving record, just so. A census is, of course, another violent form, part of the machinery of dispossession and erasure. I mean, everyone knows that in Australia, before the 1967 referendum, our First Nations people were not counted. And the census mechanism is still used globally to undercount Indigenous peoples and communities of colour for all kinds of political reasons, but also because the fantasies of extinction do not die. To break the skin of both the public address and the census, and to rub those broken bits together. To get familiar forms of representation and self-representation, often replete with violence, to go rogue to abandon the usual rhetorical and polemical modes of claiming value, space, attention for an embattled and complicatedly diverse group in favour of creating experiments so as to make possible other forms of attention. This is the shopping list for me today. How can a census as a form, treated loosely, without respect, attempted on a very small scale, useless statistically, ungeneralizable, forced into a public address, delivered orally, be used to talk about lives of writers, their bodies and their minds and their philosophies and epistemologies and the material conditions in which they live and write. Lives. Namwali Serpel said in a conversation, not with me, I heard it somewhere, I can't remember where, people chant black lives matter, but I see very little interest in actual black lives. Janine Leanne Wiradjuri writer, poet and academic from southwest New South Wales and a cherished colleague of mine at the University of Melbourne wrote some years ago, how can you, meaning white writers, think about writing about us if you don't really know us? Lives in their perpetual movement towards expansion as opposed to the ever-shrinking forms of slogans, samples, takes, statistical tidbits. I mean, how many times can we hear that the average annual income of a writer from their work as a writer is 12,000 something hundred, give or take? The constant repetition of this seemingly startling fact, 12,000, that's hardly enough for the shoelaces, has accomplished exactly nothing. There is another reason for screwing with the data-centric forms as opposed to just turning our backs on them. So many people in this country would never make it into any representative sample because they don't consider themselves writers, not publicly anyway, and their annual income from writing would be a zero or a 500 in a very good year. Perhaps they're yet to publish anything. Perhaps they're yet to finish their first big work. Deciding you can write is your life pursuit to call yourself a writer even to yourself. To get to that place, if you don't come from privilege, you have to get past a dozen minotaurs. Perhaps you haven't seen a single writer who looks like you. Money, time, class, deep responsibilities to your family, all the different generations, disability, illness, no one to tell you how good you are, no one to tell you that you don't need to go to university to become a writer. Too many cliques, too many inner circles, gatekeepers with rosy cheeks, those endless well-attended festivals and events, everyone knows each other, impenetrable. This part of my talk is for you.
A couple of weeks ago, I conducted a dirty census asking writers about their second last week in October. I turned to writers I knew or knew of. I got replies from those writers who could spare the time and from those who were generous enough to give me the time they could not spare. I will keep everyone anonymous because enough people ask me to and because I don't want to expose anyone inadvertently and because I'm not interested in engaging in case studyism. Beyond removing names, I removed most identifying details so that the game of trying to guess who's speaking could not be played. I selected and pulled out bits from responses to you, so combined responses from different people, but I did not edit or rewrite them. I should say that First Nations writers I had reached out to were too busy to respond. I want to acknowledge their absence in an otherwise diverse range of non-representative responses. In recognizing that I am taking someone else's place by standing here, my response is to look for non-dutiful, non-pious forms of decentering myself through which I do not claim some kind of goodness or exemption. It's hard for a first-generation migrant to give up power because so many kinds of power feel fundamentally out of reach. In seeking to decenter myself in this part of the address, I don't want to hide my power, my power to wound, displace, name, accrue cultural capital through events such as this. It's very small, this power in the scheme of things, but it's also quite big. I have chosen to use the first person in writing up my rogue census, to break apart the I and make it into something other than a singular and self-referential phallic little pole around which we wrap ourselves, to break it up and reconstitute it. From now on, it won't be me speaking most of the time. You need to hear through me and past me. Do you want to know about my week? One week in my life. The second last week in October, the week in which Melbourne is still in the lockdown, but not so the other states. Do you want to know about how and where I wrote this week? In the second last week of October, 2020. I wrote from the kitchen table and kitchen chair with laptop propped up on a book and portable keyboard ditto to avoid stooping. I wrote sitting on my bed, laptop stacked on a pile of pillows wearing noise cancelling headphones, originally to block the drone of the factory behind our building. I wrote curled on the sofa with my shoulders hunched around me like a vulture. I wrote on 2011 laptop that I'm going to need to max out the credit card to replace when it wears out any minute now. My OT got me an old external keyboard from the hospital, but I've just been accepted to the NDIS and I'm hoping it will find an external monitor. I wrote on my porch, at my desk, at my dining table, on my sofa, in my bed. I wrote at playgrounds on my phone. I have the notes app on my phone for all the grabbed fragments, wherever. I finished writing an essay for a book coming out next year in an anthology while my baby slept in the parked car and I worked on my laptop in the driver's seat. I wrote in a spare bedroom of my share house. The room is currently empty because someone had to leave for COVID reasons. I wrote at the kitchen table in the flat, which has no workspace separate to the living space. A part of me wishes would lease something with a second bedroom, a bigger part appreciates what this year is teaching me. This decade will see escalating shocks of many kinds. It will be important to be able to write under many different conditions. Home office, public library, rented office space. I used to leave the house regularly to write in libraries or cafes when my partner looked after the kids. But since the lockdown, there is no leaving the house, so not much writing. A lot of reading and thinking I did lying on or in my bed I really disliked and disapproved of the fact that I would often still be in my pyjamas and big socks at 2 p.m. I would get up just before 5.30 in the morning and eke out sometime before the kids wake. This only works because we moved to a house big enough they no longer get woken up by the tap of my keyboard. I have decided to rent a space outside my home for a day, a week, to see if that helps. I rented an Airbnb apartment a few blocks from home. This was technically illegal under stage four lockdown. I knew there was no way I'd be able to turn over a project of this length and complexity at home without even a desk of my own. 
the rental property was being handled by a company, not an individual. So they took my money, no questions asked. Plus my GP wrote a note saying I was a basket case and at risk and needed seclusion, just in case I got a knock on the door. Hey, I was certainly at risk, but I was probably the most COVID safe person in all Victoria during the nine days I was in the apartment. I barely went out. My desk is out in the shed, my studio. It is a multi-species space. Snails are slowly nibbling the least read books and spiders crawl across my screen at times. When it is cold and raining, I work at the dining table. I put my computer at the bottom of my wardrobe at night when I finish writing. I wrote at home, at my desk for writing I wanted to do but had no time to do. The last nine months have been one long stretch where I have taught and just taught online more than 10 hours of Zoom FaceTime with students. Add to that the time spent in preparing lectures, recording lectures, uploading lectures, troubleshooting, setting assessments, marking assessments, providing pastoral care, all, or all in all leading to a routine of hitting my desk at nine in the morning and not being able to go to bed before midnight on the good days. I feel myself after this nine months human gestation period to have been turned into a mule with all the racist humanist insinuations of barren dumbness towards a load bearing animal. I wrote at my teenage son's desk with our dog sleeping in his bed under the two blankets to the sounds of people next door renovating. It's so Australian to believe that home renovation will make death go away. Possum shit flew off their retail roof onto our kitchen window like the locust, turning our morning into the night. I used the first person not to create a composite picture in which our differences are erased or overshadowed by the imagined unity of our purpose, struggles and lived experience. There is no unity. Not to strain towards something that might sound like a singular voice but to complicate forms of self-identification available to writers. I, we, they. Breaking I from the inside allows for a different kind of unflattened, vibrating plurality. When I comes together and falls apart repeatedly to point to what is different and irreconcilable, but also to create a web of connections. Maybe not so much a web, but a mattress which can hold us if we fall from any serious height. I should say that the next section does not have a single word that belongs to me. In the second last week of October 2020, I wondered what it meant to be an author in medical exile. I wondered about the place of ghost stories and about why I was writing one. I know that deep down this manuscript is a love letter to my country of birth, a letter that is filled with a melancholy, hurt and rage for a place that may never see me as a whole, but a place that I still long for as some kind of home. I wondered if writing a prose voice was like writing performance, and if it's performance, is it like drag? And if it's like drag, what is it doing with gender other than pointing out that gender exists? In the second last week of October 2020, I wondered how and whether to engage with friends whose politics have taken a weird turn during the pandemic. They seem lost in a wilderness of conspiracy theories. In the second last week of October 2020, I wondered about ex exiting my current book project. Have I given enough to the topic? Have I taken the broad theme to a place that isn't cliche or shrill or just shit? Can I go now? I wondered if I should print out my manuscript. Is it a waste of paper? I think I hear the trees falling. When I worked as a graphic designer, the link between the hand and the page was something I very much believed in. I suppose I was trained that way to begin with a scribble. In the second last week of October 2020, I wondered if writing historical fiction was an act of imperialism, if made up stories are still relevant. Is it even possible to write landscape in this country without addressing the original apocalypse? the original solastalgia, the displacement and ecological loss of our indigenous people. I thought about the fancy way I might have written about my experiences, checking for positionality, trying not to turn a piece I was working on into a cipher for my own virtue. I thought about sentences, about making the work small, 
Last time felt like this huge, invigorating, wild, ridiculous juggle, and I cared about it deeply, yet the emphasis on ideas meant the sentences felt serviceable, and I wanted them to be more than that this time. I wondered if I should prioritize short pieces that will earn me a small immediate income over long ambitious work that will give me nothing. I felt for the 12th week in a row that my time on earth might be better spent helping support other people's creative projects rather than writing books of my own. Felt like I had taken more than my share, that I don't want to participate in the economy of mediocre books and mediocre reviews and said little online events. In the second last week of October, I considered the question of how much to say. How much is mine to say, how much is trespass, and how much of that trespass is necessary. I wondered when I am in a state of despair and don't believe in much of a future for anything, how do I write towards the future? Then having written it, how do I speak of it with sincerity when I have so much doubt? Also, when is the time for words and when do we head to the picket line? I thought obsessively about money. I worried about grammar and syntax, mostly, and trying to avoid hot air. The novel is sagging in the middle, what to cut? I tried to negotiate various speeds and abilities of using and collaborating on Zoom for disability arts events. In the second last week of October, I thought that I'm glad my book is so far from complete that I don't have to try and get published right now that it's been at least six months since I dedicated more than an hour at a time to writing, that I prefer reading, that there is not much good reading coming out of Australia right now or anywhere, or maybe I've forgotten how to do good reading because there is no way to talk about it. In the second last week of October, I had dark Thomas Bernhardian thoughts about the dwindling funds for writers the way the prize culture deforms the literary sphere, how small the writing world feels when we are cut off from the rest of the world. I thought about a culture that demands Australian stories as if to plug up the great big empty hall at its heart. In the second last week of October 2020, I thought I am the slowest writer on earth. How is it possible to be so slow? I thought about how we write about uncertainty when uncertainty is ongoing. I spend time thinking about parochialism and small stories, local stories, stories of place that happened in place. I thought that no one was in charge of the language. The language holds its enormous store of what is knowable. The writers just pan for some gold dust. I thought that less and less do I care about being an Australian writer specifically or a global writer generally. I have always had high expectations of myself as a writer, but correspondingly low expectations of what that might mean in the public sphere. It's a matter of self-preservation. The story of the arts in this country has always been that, no, frankly, you're not important, and most people don't give a fuck. In the second last week of October, after speaking with my mentor, I was uplifted and sustained, and I felt I had the most rewarding task in the world. I felt my work was important. I realised yet again how much better my work would be if I spoke Maori. In the second week of October, I wondered whether we need to rethink our notion of authorship, given how many of the books by settler authors appropriately acknowledge the role of Indigenous community members in producing these books, but there is only one name on the cover. I thought about the racist history of the Australian Children's Book Council and how the books they awarded promoted white supremacist Australian nationalist identity and how the New South Wales Premier Literary Awards has the Ethel Turner Prize for Young People's Literature. Why? I thought a lot about how confiding our conception of the writer as an individual is, how difficult it is to work, write collaboratively, and have that recognised as artistic, especially when that collaboration is non-fiction. In the second last week of October, I thought about how I had always carried anti-intellectualism and anti-creativity internally, and how I struggle with this daily. When I sit down to write, I have to contend with really toxic voices in my head that can, at times, completely flatten me. These voices have been amplified this year with the overt contempt shown by the government. In the second last week of October, I had a dream in which I proposed taking every manifesto and reframing it so that it conveyed the opposite message. 
I woke up and realized we have to stop talking about what we as writers do and trying over and over to make the case for its importance, an old story, and instead draw attention to the self-mythologies of the people building chicken coops and making rendang while locking up children and praising the Lord and being a daggy dad while also refusing to give a detained man permission to hold the three-year-old son that he has never yet held. Attempting an improvised rogue census and in bringing it into this address. I have also been looking for ways to speak of writers collectively by foregrounding different forms of socialities, reciprocities, entanglements, collaborations, dissents, which usually pass under the radar. I'm thinking about infrapolitics writers participate in, political acts, gestures and refusals that pass beneath the threshold of the political. I'm thinking about the infrapublics writers create, culturally undetectable forms of breathing and being together. Thinking with the help of infrapolitics and infrapublics might be an antidote to addressing the contempt of the nation to doing the camel work, a way of speaking up for writers and for readers, pulling apart seemingly calcified literary and non-literary forms, taking others with us through the gates, collaborating so that the logic of the singular autonomous author is shaken. This too could be a way of speaking up for writers and for readers. Prosopography is the Greek word for collective biography. Alexis Wright's Trekker is a collective biography. Its subject, Trekker Tillmouth, is one person only, if a giant in his own right, if a visionary, Wright's word, not mine. But in Trekker, his life is being told by a collective of voices, each person speaking chosen by Trekker. Let people have a say, Trekker said to Alexis Wright. Let them speak for themselves. A reasonable response, Wright notes, to a lifetime of confronting the legacy of our stories being told and misrepresented by others. A Western-style biography, she writes in the book's introduction, would never do for Tracker. Nor would a biography do for someone who said he was like a virus that could spread anywhere and never be gotten rid of, like a chameleon that could change into whatever anyone wanted him to be. That's not what we can put in government submissions and on grant applications. But submissions and grant applications do not get to decide anything about who we are. Final breath. <sighs> dear writers, dear fellow writers, just in case you are compelled by the idea of infrapolitics, shall we revolt against the logic of shortlists in which writers are pitted against each other? Shall we bury the idea of the festival panel once and for all? Shall we put on our book covers names of those who gave birth to us and showed us the world, but also of our editors, because we're sick of how so much work is made invisible? Shall we stop translating non-English language words? Shall we stop answering stupid questions during interviews and start singing instead? Shall we make sure at least one unpublished writer is published on our watch each year? Shall we go to our readers when they need us and read to them in hospital beds and on park benches in a COVID-safe way? That's it from me. Thank you.
Thank you so much again to, to uh, Maria and to Jean. And thank you to all of you for attending. Um, I wish we could all be in physical space together um, so that we could go off now and have a coffee or a drink and, and, and argue and talk. Um, and, but uh, hopefully in the, in, at the next iteration that, that will be possible. Thank you all as well who are members of Writers Victoria. Um, and for those of you who aren't, please, and you are writers, please go to our website and consider uh, joining. Uh, it's not a, you know, it's, I know times are tough. It's not a, uh, an onerous fee, I don't think, and it does do uh, quietly important work in terms of supporting the writer com writers' communities in this state. Thank you so very much. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.